Hello and welcome back. Today we will be continuing our Victoria 3 tutorial series and we're going to be talking about early game industrialization. Now this video is probably going to be pretty long, so feel free to navigate using the chapters down below and, you know, pick and choose what you want to see. There will also likely be a summary at the very end of this. And so what we will be talking about first is we will be reviewing um, some key background ideas that are going to be important to discuss in order to make sense of the rest of the video. These were discussed in previous tutorials. The tutorials will be linked below. And so we are going to get that out of the way first. And then we are going to talk about the very basic strategy uh, that you are going to be implementing as well as, you know, having a consideration for these previous things that we've talked in previous videos that informs the basic strategy. Following that, we are going to be discussing um, the three primary things. It's kind of more like two primary things that are the aspect of industrialization. And that is de-peasanting, getting rid of peasants, uh, moving people away from being peasants. And so we will talk about why this is important, why it's valuable, and this sort of thing and then also the other thing we will be talking about is ownership class in buildings why it's so important and uh you know how to think about it and this sort of thing these are the primary thrusts so the third thing is going to be construction writ large which kind of just is the arm by which you can interact with all these things and so we think about what we construct and what we do instead of constructing and so without further ado let's get into it So there are five ideas from our basic economics tutorial that are going to be uh, extremely relevant here, so we're going to discuss them briefly. The first is the building is kind of how you create value in Victoria 3, and throughout this entire tutorial we will be emphasizing that where you are throttled in the early game is how many buildings you can make. This is not the case in later phases of the game, it is the case in the early game. But moving on, the building creates value in two so sorts of ways. You have the weekly balance, when it's positive, this is value added to the economy. Um, you get this by take, taking the sell orders minus the buy orders, also the wages, and this is how you have the positive balance. But also, um, the wages themselves will also stimulate the economy. And so you are turning these goods, the process of turning goods into other goods while adding value in terms of balance and wages. This is how you create value in Victoria 3. The second idea is that prices are really important in informing what you should do. Um, generally speaking, uh, when stuff is expensive, this means you have an opportunity for a really profitable building. This is not the be all end all but this is going to be very relevant because we will have a bigger positive balance when we construct something that has a really expensive output good um, the third kind of idea that we will need to talk about is we are going to be emphasizing construction the reason for this is the fourth idea uh, because the, we can think of our construction as our GDP growth rate we think of construction as our GDP growth rate at least in the early game later on this will fall off but in the early game we think of it as our uh, you know GDP growth rate so we will be focusing construction this is another important idea specifically wood and iron because when we add construction we will create buy orders for these this drives up the price which is going to make all of these industries more profitable in this tutorial we will be explaining more deeply why we are focusing wood and iron more so than fabric and tools this is an important idea and then also uh, what we will be talking about or an important idea from that tutorial is that capitalist ownership is going to matter because capitalists contribute more money to the investment pool and you can think of industrialization the process of industrialization as you are trying to get as much capitalists uh, as higher proportion of capitalists in your economy as possible and this is important to emphasize in the early game and it's also important to emphasize that in the later stages of the game this is far less important and sometimes even bad we we'll, won't talk about how it's bad in this tutorial though because we're focusing on early industrialization when it's good the other linked tutorial is on local prices we're not going to go into a deep explanation here because we have a lot of deep explanations of local prices in various places but the main idea is that your prices are going to vary from the market price at a local level and we can think of this as our real price when we do look at this this is the real price we pay which is influenced by both the market price and the local price price and so when we have an excess of a sell orders in this case coal we are going to get a decreased price which is going to make our coal less profitable local prices will always negatively affect you and you always want to try and balance stuff locally and create economies that are vertically integrated and what I mean by that is that if we have an iron mine this iron mine creates a buy orders here for both uh, tools and coal in terms of where 
where we place stuff, it's going to be preferable that we have all of the inputs for iron mines here and also all of our buy orders for iron. In this case, we're probably going to be driving it through construction sectors in the same place. And so we will want to create local economies because every time we spread out the economy, um, the economy is suffers because we will have to buy input goods like coal in this instance at higher prices if it's not sourced locally. And when we sell coal to some place that isn't local, we will have to sell it at a lower price, which will negatively affect the balance. And so it's going to be important to think about where we place stuff, especially in the early game. So the first thing we need to think about is where we want to build. Um, there are going to be three considerations we have when deciding where to build. Uh, briefly, they are going to be, um, do we have peasants there and how many peasants do we have there? Do we have infrastructure? This is a more important question when you don't have railroads. And finally, and most importantly, how mappy is the state? What does the state's mappy look like? And when I mean by what does their mappy look like, I mean, is it a rainbow state? Do you have every color of the mineral resources? And if yes, this is is going to be a wildly preferable place to build. You know, you can build infrastructure and you can get pops to come to a place, but you can't get mineral resources any other way. And so this is going to be very, very key important because it is going to allow us to sell and buy everything at more advantageous prices and have higher weekly balances. Silesia for Prussia is a very good example of a, a, a full rainbow state because we have every one of these mineral resources. You know, especially in the early game, there's going to be the three that are very keyly important, which is going to be iron mines, coal mines and logging camps these are the three most important um, but sulfur is also going to become important for example when you get access to nitroglycerin because the uh, explosives factories which are going to get used in all of your um, mining industries are going to consume sulfur and so if we have sulfur in the same state our sulfur mine will get to sell at a higher price and then you know our explosive factory will get to buy at a lower price they will be able to sell explosives to the iron and coal mines at a higher price and the iron and coal mines will be able to buy at a lower price and all of this will increase the profits and so having all of these together is really really strong now there are going to be some other considerations but this is going to be first and foremost the most important now, Prussia had access to railroads, which means that infrastructure is much less important for Prussia. Um, it's not the same for Great Xing because it will be quite a while before Great Xing gets access to railways, mainly because you're going to be researching, you know, first romanticism and a stock exchange. And then you have quite a few texts to go, starting with cotton gin all the way into railways. It's going to be a while. And so with Prussia, you can build tall, relatively tall in a single state. You still might want to mix it around. But with someone like Great Xing, you have to be be cognizant and you have to look to actually spread out your uh, construction sectors a little bit and so we might build some in Yunnan and then we might build some in Beijing and never you know kind of just maxing out right off the bat and being really tall like we might want to do in Silesia because the considerations of the local stuff now in Yunnan we are going to have access to the three most important goods to have locally, which is iron mines, coal mines, and logging camps. And so what we will be able to do is we will be able to build a little bit up locally and then not go over the infrastructure cap. And so when we decide where to build, you know, it will be important to come in and look, hey, do we have infrastructure in this place? And then secondarily, it is important to remember, and I often forget this, if you're on the coast, you can uh, build up more than you otherwise would be able to, even if you don't have access to railroads, because you can use ports for infrastructure. And so we would want to maybe build up in outer Manchuria, Beijing, Hebei, a little bit more than we otherwise would. Now, not Shaozhou, because Shaozhou doesn't have access to coal. And so we will try and keep in mind, you know, our mappy considerations, our, you know, how rainbow is the state considerations, um, while simultaneously having an, uh, a, a sort of consideration uh, for local prices, uh, or sorry, for um, how much infrastructure we have, especially if we're playing on a relatively backward country that's not going to have railroads for a long time. So a China Open is going to look like, especially because you have a lot of money, uh, it's going to look a lot like just putting down five to ten construction sectors in a ton of different places and not maxing out construction sectors anywhere because of, as a result of, you know, your sort of considerations 
for infrastructure. So we're going to look at three examples for population to explain some ideas. And the first up is the Sikh Empire, which is in probably the strangest uh, sort of starting situation in regards to population. They start out with nearly all of their population in Punjab. This lends to, um, you know, being really decree heavy, being really good, you know, promote social mobility is better for the Sikh Empire than anyone else. They also don't have access to conquering any state with iron or coal in the immediate future. Instead, they can get a, something like Baluchistan uh, for the iron, they can get Kashmir for the coal, and for them specifically, or also Eastern Afghanistan will have a little bit of both, but then if we take a look at the pops, it's not going to be able to sustain something that's too tallly built, given how much construction we're going to have available. And so for someone like uh, the Sikh Empire, building up in Punjab can make sense, although it will feel bad because you are getting worse prices for everything. But you will probably be unlike it's unlikely you can bring all of your construction to bear in some place like eastern Afghanistan, where you will have turmoil penalties if you conquer it anyways. And so there's a good chance you want to, you know, be building steel and tools in Punjab. Jab. Another example is going to be um, Hokkaido is going to have the absolute best, uh, you know, most rainbow. It's the most rainbow state in the entire game. But the problem with Hokkaido, if we take a look, it's got 20k pops. You cannot build in Hokkaido as Japan, especially because you start off on closed borders. It's going to be extremely rough. Um, you are not going to be able to pull a lot of guys here early. It's not like they have a lot of arable land anyways for the arable, unused arable land modifier to pull in migrants. It's going to be a little bit more because you know you're going to feel it finish colonizing. But this is an example, a perfect example, in fact, of a state where you actively don't want to build despite it having really good resources because it doesn't have the population available. Punjab, you want to build in, uh, you know, uh, the capital state here, despite not having the local prices because you have so many pops. Eventually, you transition to being really textile hill, uh, mill heavy, and then eventually, as you expand, you look to put your construction elsewhere, but you probably just put it in Punjab at the start. And another really good example is West Virginia, uh, which can sometimes have really hard time employing up. You only have 50 unused arable land here. Uh, in the USA, there's going to be a ton of places that have really, really high migration pull from unused arable land. And so West Virginia is really not going to get the migration. So to Despite them having, you know, uh, both coal and iron, building in West Virginia is going to be a little bit risky because you might not be able to get the population required to employ up the buildings. If the buildings are built and there's no one working in them, they're not producing value. And so this is critically important, but very often, you know, the population will solve itself. So building tall in Pennsylvania can make a lot of sense. Um, there's also another consideration for Pennsylvania specifically, which is that the USA has a unique company in Pennsylvania that requires you having a level uh, 10 steel mill and so uh, Pennsylvania uh, and the company is Carnegie Steel let's see if we can see if this is going to require a level 10 Pennsylvania this is kind of an additional fourth consideration uh, but if we know we want to get a steel mill here first despite the fact that Pennsylvania has you know worse uh, it's not as rainbow as Alabama building in Pennsylvania first is probably going to be better although notably Pennsylvania does have uh, bonuses uh, to throughput in both coal and hardwood output, whereas Alabama just has the hardwood output. And this is another reason to maybe prefer Pennsylvania on top of Pennsylvania having a little more infrastructure, being already a little bit pushed on the economies of scale. Overall, I think Pennsylvania is uh, a little bit better, but this is an interesting sort of um, case study, if you will, where which one's better, Pennsylvania or Alabama? I think it's Pennsylvania, mainly because you want to build your steel here. You want your first 10 steel things to be here. And if your first 10 steel are going to be here, here, you might as well build the tooling workshops which consumes the steel here and the inputs for the steel in both the coal and the iron and so this is going to make a lot of sense now very quickly how can we parse through this information in the UI uh, it's useful to just go into the industry tab pick anything it doesn't matter go to settings switch it to peasants or unemployed this is going to be the most important and sort by this to see where you have a lot of available pops getting rid of unemployed pops is going to be more valuable so we might want to build in Virginia earlier than we might normally want to, also Alabama earlier than we might normally otherwise want to. Um, we went, might want to build up a few construction sectors here, although still probably focus the steel in Pennsylvania um, and hope that these people migrate out. Um, the second thing is we can also sort by infrastructure in here. Very, very simple. The other one is going to be a bit harder and sometimes requires just kind of knowing where everything is, but what we can do is we can come 
in and we can click on the good we can click on here and then we can show not local prices on map although this is something you can kind of look through but show potentials on map and so here we can sort by the potentials for coal we will see that there's this kind of line of coal as well as down here there's going to be some coal uh, and then we can also come in and do the same thing for uh, iron and the places where they intersect which is notably going to be Pennsylvania the Virginias and Kentucky and Alabama these are going to be particularly nice places and then finally you probably also want to do this for wood um, just let's come in here Ooh, let's just come in here and show potentials on map and we can see all the places and so doing a first kind of quick glance whenever you're selecting a country and using this to so kind of sort out where you want to build is probably a good idea once we've decided where we want to build we want to put down a few construction sectors you can see we have a few in Pennsylvania and Alabama just as an illustration looking to make sure we don't go over the infrastructure so we only have 10 available in Pennsylvania at this moment we probably want to get to the point where we're running an even balance before we start expanding the railroads in Pennsylvania. So what we'll do is we will build up in places other than Pennsylvania until our weekly balance is around neutral. And then, only then, will we look to put railroads down in Pennsylvania and slowly ramp up more in Pennsylvania than we will in other places. Now, another thing we've done is we've completely maxed out taxes. And you want to do this. Now, where you want to spend your authority on is going to vary from run to run. Uh, very often, if you are building in just a single state, uh, you will want to use a ton of edicts. And if you need to spread stuff out, namely road maintenance is going to be really good for the 10% state construction efficiency. So if we were playing Prussia, we might want to put down an edict with our authority. If you're playing countries that want to spread out, like Great Xing, um, you know you might want to put in a lot of consumption taxes. However, if you're paying, if you're playing someone whom you want to pass laws with very quickly, and you have uh, you know authority over a ninety, so this would be Great Xing. Sometimes it makes sense to just float, uh, make sure you're floating enough authority. But for a lot of countries, what you will want to do is you will want to max out taxes, put in as much consumption taxes as possible, specifically ones that are targeting the upper class. We talk about this more in the basic economics tutorial and just blast. Uh, you are taking money out of the economy and what you will be doing is you will be re-injecting it in the form of construction. And so we will be tr effectively, in some sort of sense, transmuting buy orders for consumer goods um, because when we tax these people, they will be able to afford less consumer goods. Their SOL will go down. The basket of goods they buy will go down. The prices will go down, this sort of thing. We will be transmuting the demands for all of these goods to the construction goods. So this will re-stimulate the economy and it will give us opportunities to build profitable buildings specifically in the things we have already kind of had an eye towards, which is going to be wood and iron most specifically, but also coal is going to be important because of completing the loop. And we will also, you know, value tools as well uh, and kind of ignore fabric or look to solve fabric through trade. Now, when these construction sectors finish, we should have really inflated prices for all of these goods. So we can do a little bit of magic and see when they're more expensive. So we've let it build for a hot minute and you can see the price of these is gonna be high. This means that we are gonna have possibilities or potentials for really profitable buildings. Of course, we're running a shortage on iron. You don't wanna run a shortage. You can import in order to prevent this, but generally you're gonna to wanna to produce it yourself. But we have also run down the balance. We wanna run down the balance to medium or to being break even and then solve this stuff by building more of the goods. Now, particularly with wood, uh, you generally want to be on price prioritize softwood production on most places and then target some places with prioritized hardwood. The hardwood places you want to target are going to have to do with two things. Uh, if you have an output bonus, you're going to want to do it uh, there. And also, if you have some sort of input there locally, uh, in this case, for, for example, furniture, also arms and the second PM of ships is going to have input a demand for, um, you know, hardwood. These are going to be the places preferable to have it, but the lion's share of your places you want to be on softwood prioritization. But uh, this is going to increase uh, the price up really high. And you can see the weekly balance we have now is absolutely massive here. And so this is going to be kind of a loop uh, by which you are going to be primarily, at least early on, you are going to be just 
increasing your construction until you hit a shortage and then solving the shortage uh, by building more of the goods. Uh, and also, uh, if you hit this break even point where see now we actually are break even, now we switch and we're gonna focus instead on iron. And so, you know, it's this like feedback loop. We're going to, you know, increase construction. Uh, it gets too expensive. We're gonna do these other goods. And this, you'll be able to do this for some time uh, until you get to the point where, you know, you can't really, uh, the buildings aren't going to be really profitable when you add them, the prices aren't expensive, and you're still break even. And so let's talk about construction a little bit more. So this is a bit of a bridge section because we're going to keep talking about construction this entire time. But there's two kind of important things to emphasize here, which is, first of all, construction is like the initial basis upon which the economy and as its whole is kind of stimulated. It's stimulated through other government spending, not just construction. But an important thing to recognize is that as we are building these construction sectors, then we are building a bunch of the construction goods, right? And so we will create a bunch of profitable wood places. And then as we create profitable wood places, places this will spin more money into the economy in that we will have places with a really high positive balance let's find a place with a higher positive balance um, they're gonna have a really high positive balance this positive balance will then get spent mostly on consumer goods we will get some reinvestment but it will be get spent mostly on consumer goods so we are driving up the price and then we are creating opportunities for really profitable buildings like the logging camps and then we are satisfying that opportunity driving the price back down but in doing so we are creating a really high weekly balance and this weekly balance is then spent on consumer goods which drive up their price, which allows us profit, uh, opportunities for profitable building. It's not the case that you should never build any consumer goods. It's just that you should have a preference for not building as many or focusing it on as much unless you know you can get a really, really profitable building, which you can get really high earnings once you spin money throughout the, through the economy and really ramp up construction and all the industrial sector. And so it's a, like it's very it's a very subtle thing, but it's important to recognize when you add construction, you are making your textile mills more profitable. This is also true because you are taking peasants and we will talk about more peasants more later. You're taking people out from being peasants where they are producing all of these goods and consuming less than they think they are of all of these goods uh, and so this will also decrease the supply of goods a little bit uh, but will, will greatly increase the demand for these goods and so this is how you get more opportunities for profitable buildings. You're getting them first just from the buy orders, uh, you know, off the construction sectors themselves, but you're also getting them from the downstream effects of having a really profitable building that was created by the construction sector, now being able to create a ton of buy orders for consumer goods. But you've got to lead with the construction sectors, and you can't be scared of, you know, uh, the inputs for construction being expensive, because that just means you have an opportunity to build a really profitable building. Right now, we can build really profitable iron mines. Now, another thing that's important to emphasize, and we probably should have done it in the earlier section, the PM before atmospheric engine on iron is dookie. We're gonna talk a little bit more about PMs now. Just to be clear, we're gonna be busting out the spreadsheet, so if you have any children under the age of 13, ask them to leave. So we see here the iron mines, and we are going to need to unpack this spreadsheet because it's kind of a lot to take in, and we are going to be leaning on it quite a bit for the remainder of this tutorial, and so uh, let's get to it. So the input column is the input goods, multiplied by the number uh the base price of the good so in this case for picks and shovels this would be tools um i think tools have a base price of 40 so this must be an input of five tools for the input goods price for output it's the same idea but it's multiplied by the output goods and we'd get the net by uh taking the output minus the input and uh this is going to be very very important to the late game but in the early game the net is not as important what we care about in the early game is the net construction efficiency. The reason for this is construction is a limited resource. And even if a building is more profitable on its own, we care that the amount of time it takes to construct. And so, for example, uh, in the early game, we'll be on sawmills. Those have a net of 1,000. Uh, but if we take a look at the iron mines on condensing pump engine, which is relatively early, we'll see that they're 1,350, which might make you think, hey, I want to produce more iron mines. But on a per construction basis, we're adding 67 value, or per week of construction basis, we're adding 67 
value with an iron mine at base prices. It's important to emphasize that if the price of iron is high enough, this will be way higher, right? Uh, but on a per construction basis, we're adding 67.5 of value. And then on a per construction basis, a per week of construction, we're adding 100 with sawmills. And so this is a very, very important thing and it is going to make it so that resources in particular are always looking better at a net construction efficiency than the manufacturing goods. Now the manufacturing goods, like let's say the tooling workshop, if we take a look here, the net is going to be 1600. So the net on the tooling workshop or on the tooling workshop for steel tools is very very efficient in the sense of a per worker basis, but on a per construction basis, it's not as good as iron or wood. And this is the main reason we are focusing on this. Coming back and kind of explaining some more of this, we have this efficiency column. Now, we're not going to talk too much about equilibriums because this is a more advanced concept, but the more efficient a building is, that is, the greater the amount of its output divided by its input, this means the building can still employ up uh, and be profitable with a lower price. So with an efficiency of 600, because the output is so much bigger than the input here, we can have a really, really depressed wood price and still have buildings be profitable and employ up. Um, this means that with stuff with really low efficiency, you should never try and get the price really low. So uh, the particular standout is gonna be steel has a really low efficiency. You, this is why you can't really get steel prices very low in the economy because they will hit equilibrium employment faster. A quick note on throughput and also the spreadsheet is it's primarily evaluating stuff on how efficient uh, something is per construction. If you're absolutely out of labor, you stop caring about how efficient something is per construction and you start caring about how efficient it is per laborer in which case you know throughput starts to improve or starts to look a little bit better you know on the industries uh, stuff like steel mills motor uh, motor industries and tooling uh, manufacturers uh, because these are generally you know these construction costs these 800 construction buildings tend to be more efficient per worker um, than per construction but if you're not in this case uh, it's going to be less important just a brief note at the die work shops will be a little bit better because it's assumed you have craftsman sewing which will add a marginal 20 value going from you know nothing to craftsman sewing will add a little bit so 46 but that 46 is still nothing compared to you know 100 on a per construction basis. We're not going to go too in depth into late game scenarios here, but I just wanted to show off uh, this Minas uh, Cherais we have here in a late game Brazil, where we have uh, a furniture manufacturer that's fully, fully employed, very, very, very profitable, and also a logging camp that is not profitable or not profitable enough to maintain full employment. It's at an equilibrium employment. It's not really employing up. It's been at a low employment this entire time. And the reason for this is not that logging is a bad industry, nor do we regret building 24 of these. This was really, really good in the early game. But what this happens is this falls off because on a per worker basis, um, this is logging camp employing 15K, the 15K would be better served to be employed in the furniture manufacturers because it's more efficient per worker. In fact, we're even using assembly lines here. Um, this is a dark, dark timeline where assembly lines actually make sense to be using for us uh, because we have, well, part of it's we have a ton of throughput and this is kind of a later and mid game situation. But the bigger part of it is that these PMs on these low construction buildings are really, really efficient per construction, but they're much less efficient, you know, on a per pop basis. And so when you start running out of labor, which is definitely what has happened to us here in Brazil, when you run out out of labor, then the paradigm will shift. But in the early game, you are going to care really, really about low construction buildings. So coming back into you know the spreadsheet for the illustrating the point, we were on electric sawmills, and I don't think we were on hardwood production. Um, so we had a net efficiency of 1450, and we didn't read too much into um, you know prices because they were all relatively middling. Uh, but we had a uh, net of 1450 on electric sawmills and a net construction efficiency efficiency per construction of 145. And I don't remember if we were pushing hardwood or not uh, but coming on over if we were pushing hardwood the hardwood price is depressed so it's kind of whatever but coming on over the efficiency per construction of the furniture manufactory is way less than 145 but we come and take a look the net is going to be the 750 plus this it's going to be 2450 and so the efficiency per worker is much much higher now in the early game we don't care about that we care about net construction efficiency 
Now, talking about how price signals us, you know, in light of all this, uh, in the early game, as long as we have peasants, uh, this means that anytime these are even remotely expensive, these being the resource industries and the wood industries, these are absolutely the buildings you should be building, um, in particularly in the early game, because we know they are disgustingly efficient on a per construction basis. However, as a signal in the late game, as you start running out of pops, as you start running out of laborers, you should expect these to rise in price pretty much no matter what. Uh, e even if you have a ton of available resources, just as a result of your economy recomping to uh, be more pop efficient towards more of these industrial goods which will have more outputs uh you know per laborer rather than per construction and so just in terms of identifying the pricing signals um you are going to care about a price differently depending on how much pop what your population looks like in relative or have a how many gainfully employed you have relative to peasants uh but we're talking about industrialization we're talking about the early game we're talking about while well, you have peasants and so as long as this is anywhere remotely in the realm of like high or high-ish or middling you should be building with your construction uh wood first and then iron and there's another reason why you should build wood is because we are going to overvalue uh, beyond just uh, you know the output per construction which is something that's fine on fabric which we're not going to value uh beyond that we care about getting rid of peasants <laughs> Okay, so the best way to think about peasants and why you should be getting them off of subsistence farms uh, in particular is that they are crypto bros. They buy fake goods with fake money. Allow me to explain. Uh, the peasants are working the subsistence farms and the subsistence farms, they pay them wages, not a lot, almost nothing and instead they pay them in what is known as subsistence output this is fake money it doesn't exist in any other form it is not taken from someone else and it is paid to the peasants the peasants then turn around and they use this to buy goods but only 10 percent of their buy orders reach the market and so only 10 percent of their buy orders uh, go into here uh, but they are purchasing their basket of goods as if 100 percent went in terms of their income and so they are buying with their fake money that they are receiving they're buying with this money uh, that they are receiving in the subsistence output this is money they receive and then they buy the fake goods if we take a look at the peasants and we click on one of them we can see and take a look at the economy we can look at their weekly pop income and we will see uh, of the 23k that these guys are receiving 18k of this comes from subsistence output. This is not taken from anyone. It is not taxed. If we take a read of it, it's an in-kind uh, income that peasants regenerate, uh, which represents the work they perform, the work they perform, fake goods, fake money, producing goods to cover their own needs. Unlike wages, the subsistence output is not paid out from the building's revenue, so the building can still achieve revenue, and is not subject to income taxes. And so, we have fake goods, fake money. Now, I wasn't able to find in-game where the tooltip is. Uh, it was buried. I couldn't find it. Uh, but consumption is multiplied by 0.1 before adding it to state consumption. And this is what I'm talking about when I say they buy fake goods. Only 10% of the goods they buy are real. And the remainder the remainder is uh, just imaginary goods because it's not actually producing any sort of buy orders in the market. What this means is that when you build a building that is going to employ peasants up to the same S well that they have normally which to be fair they tend to have you know not the most insanely low sol when you employ uh one of these guys up to the point where they're going to have nine sol what this is going to do is it's going to 10x their consumption and also uh, decrease the sell orders of these goods to the market and so this is really going to drive up the price of these goods in a, and this is what we kind of mean when we said you know in the last section how driving and building a ton of buildings driving a ton of construction is going to be pushing up these prices in addition to the effect that you get from having a higher proportion of your economy in the industrial sector, which does have an effect, you are also driving up the needs by taking these people out from the subsistence farms, which is going to increase the prices of all your consumption goods, giving you opportunities to build profitable buildings. Now, even if we were building buildings that were exactly break even, um, it would still be worth it to take, peasant, take pops out from being peasants and instead moving them to a different building.
buildings. So, for example, farms, uh, you know, food industries, uh, logging camps, cotton uh, plantations. And the reason for this is that this economic activity is actually just 10% economic activity because there's so much fake activity. There's fraud going on. And instead, um, the reason why this would be preferable is because GDP matters and GDP matters on the back of it is going to affect, particularly in the early game, minting. You get minting from a base value and then also a percentage of your GDP. You can see here, we have 17 million GDP, we get 1700 uh, in minting for free. And so this economic activity that we are receiving in the arable land, this is not a lot of goods that are being output. GDP is calculated based on your output goods, right? And so since this is not worth a lot, even if the building didn't have a positive balance because it was paying way more in wages and way more in input, it would be preferable because it would drive up GDP and it would give us minting. Minting, by the way, is better than tax income. It's better than tax income because it's a free money modifier. It does not take money from POPs. When we tax from POPs, they have less money to pay for their consumption goods so they can't drive up the price of stuff and give opportunities for profitable buildings. When we get minting, it doesn't do this. It's free money, and so this allows you to circulate money through the economy faster. So if we, if there was a theoretical building called non-fake uh, subsistence farm, like real work farm, uh, what it would do, and it just had 10 times the wages and 10 times the output, um, you know, and the balance was exactly the same, this would be preferable because it would increase GDP more because GDP is calculated based on the output of the goods. And so this is a fundamental important point and it would also it's a free money modifier it would allow us to spin 10 times the amount of money into the economy in the form of minting now Qing is an interesting one to think through here because Qing actually doesn't have a lot of buildings I mean they have a good chunk of buildings uh, let's be real but they don't have an enormous amount of buildings relative to the size of their GDP a huge portion of their GDP is actually being driven by these subsistence farms. And if we take a look at, you know, the income, they're not getting a lot from income tax. To be fair, they don't have enough. Um, they have a lot of tax waste and this type of stuff. They're not receiving a lot from poll taxes relative to minting. They will have the most minting in the game, um, you know, relative to their national revenue out of any other uh, country at game start that is not leveraging gold specifically. Um, and so you can kind of think about it in this situation of Great Xing, why they have so much income is kind of because they have 36 million pops working real jobs. Now, I say 36 million pops working real jobs because they have 360 million ones working fake jobs, but this is going to, uh, you know, over the course of a very large number, uh, it's going to allow for, you know, a quite a big amount of minting to take place. Um, and this is also one of the reasons why Qing is so powerful, economically speaking, is because they have so many pops that can be de-peasanted relative to other people, so they can be in this mode where they are focusing on construction efficiency above all else, rather than caring about pop efficiency. They can be in this mode for longer, and this mode is most explosive. This is the industrialization mode um, where we are caring and focusing on resources above manufacturing because they are more efficient per point of construction and they are taking people out from being peasants and they are turning them into laborers who work for real wages and buy real goods. Generally speaking, uh, focusing on resources first can also smooth out your curve as it relates to qualifications because the resource industries tend to employ more laborers which are easier to find qualifications for than they do more special uh, people and so if you are someone who has struggles with qualifications this is going to be helpful as well and in particular of note for serfdom is it enables serfdom here uh, in the production which is only going to give three fake money um, and it's also going to produce more grain as opposed to uh, you know uh, free peasants which is going to be tenant commercial homesteaded etc all the other ones which are going to give four fake money which is going to increase SOL which is going to help to positively affect qualifications uh, for a lot of, uh, you know, qualifications. It is contingent upon, you know, education access and academia uh, is going to give wealth education access uh, as it will empiricism. And so the additional uh, one fake income uh, will allow you to, and it's quite a bit more than one, it's just one of one unit of fake income uh, will give, uh, you know, quite a bit of SOL. And so moving from serfdom to free peasants is going to be an important thing to take 
note um, as part of you know your industrialization strategy you are going to want to do this even though you will produce less grain um, it is important for maintaining qualifications as well as um, generally speaking you're going to prefer tenant farmers and homesteading for other reasons um, you know related to more political considerations clout these sort of things now much in the same way we look at you know expensive prices and say hey this is an opportunity for a profitable building we can also think of unemployed pops first which are going to be you know more worth getting a job for but also peasants as opportunities uh to be in this zone where we can have a really really uh, productive construction where our construction can be extraordinarily efficient we'll prefer to go after unemployed first because unemployed people are working zero percent of a job peasants you can think of them as working 10 percent of a job that's really not even that efficient anyways uh because even if you 10x stuff it still wouldn't be absolutely incredible um, and so you can think of it like this and think of this as a signal that you should be in a mode where you are caring about um, efficiency per construction not efficiency of the building. So when you look at a building and you're like looking, hey, I have four furniture manufacturers. These four furniture manufacturers, they have a weekly balance of 6K and I'm getting, what is that, like 1.5K a piece. And then here I have five of these and they're getting much less. You have to remember um, that this took one thing third of the construction as you know it takes three times as much construction to pump out a furniture manufacturing and so anytime you like see a positive balance you have to you know reference this against how much construction it costs um, and this is going to be very very key as long as you have peasants um, as long as you have peasants this is going to be kind of what you want to focus on So at this point, the elephant in the room is, why don't we build cotton plantations? They cost 200 construction. They have 80 efficiency per construction. This is solid. Why are we focusing on wood and fabric uh, specifically? And the reason for this, the reason for this is ownership. Now the ownership of cotton plantations, the ownership of cotton plantations is going to be aristocrats instead of, as opposed to, capitalist ownership. And the big thing, the big difference between the two of these is aristocrats will contribute 10% of their dividends income, the dividends being the weekly balance here, they will contribute 10% of that to the investment pool and capitalists will contribute 20%, which has a variety of other effects. Um, the kind of three reasons as a result of these effects and kind of others uh, that we really care about ownership is going to be name, number one, politics. We'll briefly cover that. This really isn't a video on politics. Uh, number two, it's effectively a tax on the upper strata, which is a preferable type of tax. And so we would prefer it to be bigger. And third is going to be uh, the free money modifier that you get off of the industrialist uh, contribution specifically. So um, kind of just quickly covering the politics one because this really isn't a video on politics. Uh, landowner class will be empowered when you have a ton of aristocratic owned buildings. Generally speaking, the landowners favor laws you really don't like. And so this will make politics a little bit more annoying. Um, if you import, you know, the agrarian goods and you depress the amount of the profitability of these guys and the amount that the auto queue will build because when you import something if we import grain for example it will be less likely that our auto queue picks it up so fewer of these will get built they won't be as profitable they won't expand as often we will get fewer landowners and so um, conversely capitalists are primarily industrialists uh, they are not primarily landowners they are primarily industrialists if we take a look and we hover over here and we hover over here and we hover over here we will see they are mainly industrialists and a little bit of armed forces they favor a lot of laws you really like like for example laissez-faire which we'll talk about in a little bit um, but they also favor you know free trade which is going to be really good when we talk about trade we'll touch on this a little bit but not quite a video on trade um, and so we are going to politically prefer the capitalists because it's going to positively affect clout money is a huge driver of you know clout in the game and one of the big reasons one of the very very big reasons that getting the landowners out of power is so hard in a country like let's say ching is that they have so much aristocrat owned buildings and i know what you might be thinking what do you mean they really don't have that that many and they actually have quite a few of these capitalist owned buildings well the sub 
subsistence farms are aristocrat owned. The ownership in these is going to be aristocrat slash clergy, and this is going to greatly empower some of these high pop starts. And so, um, you know, it's going to be a, a pretty big difference in terms of clout. And so this is just something to consider, but it's not going to be primarily what we're talking about. So we can think of uh, this IPT transfer as a tax. Um, it's a 20% tax on capitalists and a 10% tax on aristocrats. And this is an extra tax on the upper class, which is very, very much preferable. And so, um, you know, just kind of taking a look at it, we can see 1K is going to, going to be spent on their needs and 272 is gonna get reinvested. It's gonna go to this investment pool. Now, as a proportion of your income, especially in the early game, before you get onto proportional taxation plus, um, the investment pool is going to occupy a larger proportion of your income as is minting uh and so uh we talked about why minting was important to deep peasant pops but the investment pool um as if it's a larger portion of your economy it's going to be more important that you try and make up your economy in such a way that you're going to be generating more through investment pool now thinking about the 80 and 90 um we would prefer to create buy orders for construction. Um, when an aristocrat is uh, spending 90% of their money that they are receiving through dividends on these goods, they are pushing up the prices of all these. When a capitalist spends 80%, he's pushing up the price of all these. When that 10% from the aristocrats goes into the investment pool, it instead can only be used to buy construction goods. So it's pushing up the price of those, which are the industries we're focusing on and we would prefer to rise in price more, especially because we will benefit more from economies of scale. The capitalist spends double. Now, on top of this, we would prefer to tax the upper strata. Now, we covered this in kind of the basic uh, economics tutorial that we did, but just very briefly, um, the upper strata has exponential needs. So the higher and higher your SOL gets, um, this is going to increase at an increasing rate the amount of stuff you consume that's luxury. So, for example, luxury furniture, there's a few other exponential needs. So at like SOL 20, we might consume 10, and then SOL 21, we might consume you know 11 and then uh, at SOL 22 uh, it might be uh, 13 going up at an increasing rate and so this means uh, in order to move up to the SOL next SOL level you will need an exponentially higher income and so you cannot push up SOL very very efficiently if you are in the upper strata because you will need more and more and more having a high SOL or high average SOL is a good thing uh, so when you tax the lower strata they have largely linear needs um, their needs go up in a much more linear fashion with related uh, to how much money they are getting or in relation to their SOL. And so when they get money, when they get 50 coins, they can increase their SOL more than when the upper strata gets 50 coins. And so always you are going to prefer to tax the upper strata. And so getting something that is effectively a 20% tax on the upper strata, you know, at least their dividends is tremendously useful, even if the building has a lower weekly balance um, because we would prefer to create buy orders and add construction and add construction goods rather than creating buy orders for consumer goods um, you know it, which is the effective difference between the two of these this is why by the way when we talked about taxes we talked about how taxing liquor might not be preferable to taxing something that makes less money because the less money thing the luxury clothes are specifically tar targeting the upper strata so it'll positively affect your sol now sometimes you just want to blast construction you don't care about sol that much if you have a lot of peasants you don't care about sol and you just blast on the liquor anyways however it will negatively affect your sol more than extracting taxes through luxury goods but beyond this beyond the tax consideration which is already really substantive right it's important to emphasize that this is just extra income at a point in the game where you don't have a lot of income if from the pops that you particularly want to get income from you want to extract wealth from them um, beyond this it is easier to stack free money modifiers on your industrialists. See, the industrialists will always contribute 20%, no matter what. Um, this is the amount they contribute. However, sometimes a different amount will actually get there. There are both bonuses and malices. And if we come into the industrial thing, we will see that uh, we will get 10% uh, capitalist investment pool contribution efficiency as a bonus when they are happy. This will get doubled if they're above 20% clout for a 20% bonus. But at the 10% bonus, what will happen is they will contribute 20%. From their dividends, 20% will be extracted every time. But 22% will be what hits the investment pool. So that extra 2% 
that's free money, baby. And if it's free, it's for me. The landowners have a similar modifier. However, laissez-faire is far and away the best economic system. You do get more aristocratic investment pool efficiency. And to be fair, on someone like China with all those sub-farms at the start, which are contributing to the investment pool, it's actually better on China to go agrarianism and probably the EIC, but those are maybe the only two exceptions. Um, because you can't construct an entire economy with aristocrats, but you can construct most of your economy with capitalists. But kind of brushing that aside, because that's a mid-game kind of conversation the capitalist investment you can get plus 50 percent here you can get minus 25 on the capitalist if you do this but keeping these guys happy is going to be hard throughout the game and eventually you will actually just collapse the prices of all your agrarian goods if you decide to go uh you know for agrarianism and the reason for this is because you have no way of really pushing buy orders for all of these goods um you can push the buy orders for stuff like all the construction goods by building a bunch of of, you know, uh, what is it, uh, government-owned buildings, um, you know, that push up this stuff. Uh, but in particular, uh, over the course of the game, agricultural prices tend to get depressed, which is going to eat into your profit. And then uh, it's not going to matter that you're getting, you know, this huge investment pool, like a bonus of plus 50%. But even if you are getting plus 50%, to be far, that's a bigger free money modifier. Um, that's a plus 50% on their initial modifier or their initial amount of, uh, you know, uh, what is this? Uh, they are contributing 10%. So getting plus 50% um, on this on top of plus 20% uh, is like they will get plus 7% um, in the best, best case scenario. With the capitalists... The capitalists will be contributing 20% uh, if they get, in the best case scenario, this 20%. And then you go on to laissez-faire to get an additional 25%. Um, in that case, oops, that's not laissez-faire. Uh, laissez-faire will get an additional 25% also notable to the investment pool contributions efficiency also notable this isn't a video about capitalism versus laissez-faire or laissez-faire versus other systems but you are getting a company and also a minus loan interest rate which are both incredible but this 25 percent capitalist investment pool contribution it will add up to a total of 45 percent uh, modified it will be nine percent extra free money modifiers. So the max free money the landowners can get is 7%. The max free money that the industrialists can get is 9%. And so this is really one of the huge reasons why you're going to prefer this. Um, it, in all but the most, the countries with the absolute most subsistence farms, like Great Xing, you actually would prefer agrarianism at the start. Um, but even when you prefer agrarianism, you still build the capitalist buildings um, because of other things going on with Great Xing. Namely, when you build agrarian stuff, you cause a ton of unemployment but that's kind of a little bit of an aside but we are going to prefer the ownership uh, of capitalists so that brings us back to the spreadsheet to talk about this column, which is how much investment pool you are getting per construction. And so this is taken by, you know, taking a look at the net, uh, dividing by the construction, and then multiplying uh, by the ownership contribution per uh, percentages. And so here we can see, um, and this is important to remember, this is giving you a free money modifier as well as a greater tax modifier. And so this is going to allow you to spend more money into the economy, both by extracting and then re-injecting in terms of construction goods and also the free money just spins better um, and you can see uh, something like sawmills is going to have 29 um, it's important to note that simple forestry is not owned by capitalists that's why it's so much worse than sawmills and also picks and shovels not capitalist owned we'll talk about that in a little bit um, but this is going to spend way way more money in the economy way more free money um, this was more important in uh, earlier patches but if we compare it to something like agriculture and we compare it to something like a wheat farm you know uh, that we are not on publicly traded because now this column means publicly traded um, this is under laissez-faire how construction efficient it is because um, laissez-faire doesn't matter uh, because it's not capitalist owned here we will see 6.5 if we're comparing soil enriched farming which is even kind of a little bit of a later technology relative to you know the very very early sawmills 6.5 versus 29 and so we will be getting way 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 more construction efficiency or uh, investment pool 
per construction, and this uh, kind of holds true throughout. Um, the uh, the in manufacturing industries are not that efficient, but it's important to remember this is calculating per construction, not per worker. Uh, on a per worker basis, of course, these are going to start looking much, much better later on. Um, but this is a, a huge reason why we are not going to focus on the agrarian goods, um, is that they are just not very good at generating money, um, you know, to kind of put into the, uh, to put back into construction, to fold into your GDP growth rate, because you're not extracting as much taxes, and you're not getting a free money modifier. Now, there are a couple exceptions to this rule or this way of thinking. This was really, really solid in, um, you know, 1.4. But in 1.5, uh, I mean, this is obvious what, what's going on here, right? The rice farms are broken. Uh, and I expect, I mean, I expect them to be nerfed, but I've expected them to be nerfed, uh, like, all this time. And you see, on a con per construction basis, wow, 27, uh, con uh, contribution to the investment pool under laissez-faire. That is insane. Uh, that is no free money modifier. Rice farms are going to be very, very efficient on a per construction basis. However, if you build a bunch of rice farms, you will collapse the prices, at which point they're not really that useful. And so sprinkling in a few agrarian goods can be okay now in a way that it wasn't okay in 1.4. Specifically, um, we're going to talk about which ones, but the rice farms at uh, are really really disgusting because if you take a look at you know these numbers these numbers should look uh, a little familiar under soil enriched fertilizer and soil enriched fr fertilizer hey it's exactly it's exactly double in a lot of these spots um or sorry it's got like double the double the 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 net uh if we take here rye is actually going to be the next best one and so maybe comparing it to rye is not the best um but the rice is disgustingly efficient because they double the inputs, they double the outputs, they doubled the labor. So it's not more labor efficient. Um, and they did not increase the price uh, of construction. It's still 200 construction. This is obscene. It's effectively two buildings for the price of one. And on a de-peasanting basis, there is nothing in the game better than a rice farm. It's just, uh, it's just insane. However, you cannot buoy up the price of all the rice outputs. You cannot buoy up the price of, um, you know, uh, the, the, and this is what we were talking about with agrarianism. You cannot buoy up the price of grain. You cannot buoy up the price of, um, the fruit and you cannot buoy up the price of sugar very, very well. And so this is not going to be, uh, something you focus on, but sprinkling in small amounts, maybe putting one in a few places and putting it on auto expand is a decent shout it's also really good for increasing your credit line uh, because the building will have a really really large um, balance that it can have uh, or it will add more to the credit line on a per construction basis than any other building in the game so that's thing one is the rice um, thing two is rye farms are relatively good and they in particular their secondary good is going to be liquor uh, which is kind of a preferable secondary good because it'll more positively affect your sol than a secondary good like um, sugar and fruit and so rye farms are going to be kind of the next best grain and building a few rye farms is going to be you know somewhat reasonable and then also um, cotton plantations are going to be of the plantations they are going to be one of the better ones um, and uh, it's important to note uh, cotton gin gives 25% throughput so building one or two cotton plantations specifically for local price considerations when there is more than double the buy orders than there is the sell orders is going to be a pretty good shout because the price will be pretty buoyed up relatively high it won't be collapsed and you will get 25% throughput um, with just a single building and so it will effectively be a hundred 125% of the building when you are building for local price consideration so right uh, cotton will be decent in some situations opium is going to be good just because opium is pretty efficient um, and also you kind of want to lock in uh, your opium slots sometimes if you don't have a lot you want to make sure that your your place is producing opium so this is another one and that is kind of you know it in terms of like what you maybe want to focus I guess a, a, an occasional die and uh, you know you I think if something is at double the the buy orders and sell orders then you can start building these things for local price reasons a little bit uh but for the most part you want to avoid them uh with the exception of rice rice is insane it's obscene it's it's uh, bleh. i expect it to be nerfed which is why i didn't make it like an emphasis point of this video but it hasn't been nerfed it's like on a per construction basis important not per pop basis on a per construction construction basis it's just absurd
So to round out the video, I wanted to briefly talk about tech and trade because these are two highly relevant things, um, but it's not really what the conversation is about. Um, and so for trade, uh, the way we are going to satisfy the sell orders as much as possible for the agrarian stuff we're trying to not build, we're trying actively to not build, is we are going to import it. Even if we're building a smattering of some of these goods for local price considerations, we will still want to depress the market price through imports in order to be more specialized in capitalist activity as a result of wanting to be more capitalist oriented. And so we will want to import specifically uh, very much so on grain and fabric are going to be the two biggest ones uh, because grain has such a positive effect on SOL. This is also one of the reasons why building grain, even if it's not rice, is kind of okay is because it's going to really positively affect SOL. So as you run out of peasants, grain becomes a lot better. Um, uh, you know, you're going to want to import silk and dyes, especially because China will generally produce silk extremely efficiently. There will pe be people with really depressed dye prices and you don't want to uh, try and produce dyes. A lot of these goods, you know, get really depressed in some of these markets and you don't want to try and build it yourself, um, you know, to try and uh, like minus 75. You There's so many minus 75 for agrarian goods. And this is like, if this wasn't the case, building agrarian goods would also be better. better. But there's so many minus 75 prices floating around that you can really depress the price of your inputs really low on top of not being able to, you know, drive a lot of these, uh, these uh, too high. But if we take a look here, minus 75 on this, minus 49 on this, you know, minus 21 on this. And so you can import stuff down, even eating a ton of efficiency and get a low price uh, such that it would not even be that profitable a building. It wouldn't be that efficient in your economy. And once you do that, then you don't want to build these things. Um, it's just, you know, if you are starting to ramp up, actually, maybe maybe rye farms aren't even worth it when you can just import grain from China. It's it's a little bit of a thing, but this is how you solve the problem. Um, you This is how you import. And furthermore, um, you are trying to focus on wood and iron and to a lesser extent, you can also focus on fish a little bit, although this is a bit of a complicated thing relating to how substitution doesn't work how it should, because fish is a substitute for grain, but often if you focus on it too much, it gets more depressed in price for grain and pops won't consume it uh, because substitution doesn't work the way it should. Um, so you can build a little bit of fish wharves because they are capitalist owned. They do cost 200 construction. I'd like to put them on auto expand in a lot of my runs, but this is something you could do. Uh, but as it relates to trade, coming back to trade, um, e exporting wood is going to be really good. And also you can import iron while you're still on the first PM, because the first PM is terrible, and after that you can switch to exporting iron and coal, and that way you are getting to, you are, um, by turning your economy to be heavier in the wood and the iron, because this is effectively what it does, it drives up the price and it makes it so that you can build profitable buildings with the inflated price, you will have more opportunities for profitable buildings at a higher rate for these industries. And so what this does is it will increase the amount of wood and iron you can build relative to something, say, tools in the loop, which is not going to be as efficient on a per construction basis, which will allow you to de-peasant pops to industrialize faster. And so uh, you will definitely want to export a especially the cheaper goods, um, or not cheaper goods, the goods of the buildings that cost less construction, that way you can be more specialized. I don't think you wanna to import tools. I do think you wanna do, you wanna use local economies. And to be some, to some extent, you want to, uh, you will tolerate a lower price um, uh, from wood and iron of what you're building before you want to build tools, but eventually tools get expensive and you wanna to build tools and it's the thing you want to build. Um, they are they're more uh, they're also more efficient per pop so they are a better transition good they're really good transition good when you start starting to running out of pops but that's not what this video is about this video is about when you have a ton of peasants and you want to get rid of all of them and so that is the trade kind of consideration that we have going on so I wanted to talk about technologies that are related to this uh, you know, process of industrialization, turning both capitalist and de-peasanting, which for the most part, for most countries, will be kind of the tier one to two techs. But for countries like China, you're still going to be industrializing for a while, even to the deeper techs. The important techs to note in the society tech tree are going to be uh, stock exchange, which is going to give you 10% MAPI. This is the most important tech in the game if you don't have it researched. I think Qing is the only country that doesn't research this first, and it's because 
because they research romanticism so they can go agrarianism, um, but also corporate charters and joint stock companies. We didn't really talk about corporations too much. Um, we do talk about it in our corporations tutorial video and they are going to be important, um, but we are not going to cover it too much. And also to a lesser extent, pharmaceuticals unlocking uh, you know, uh, health insurance is going to be something we care about. Uh, public health insurance is extremely meta. It will allow you to solve qualifications. Um, and this is going to be something that allows you to be in the kind of zone where you are turning pops uh, from peasants uh, because it will positively affect mortality and also uh, pollution um, and a bunch of other things. It's going to allow you to stay in the phase where you're in the industrialization phase when you have a lot of excess pops. It'll let you stay in it for longer. For production tax, we have all the techs we need to emphasize here are going to be the techs that allow you to shift from being merchant guild owned, um, you know, to being capitalist owned. Uh, the very first PM of tools and pretty much everything, if we take a look, is not going to have capitalist ownership. Instead, they have shopkeeper ownership, which only contribute 5% of their income to the investment pool. You would never stay on these because these PMs are really bad, but just kind of quickly going through some of them that is important to note. Lathe does all the ones for consumer goods or it does several of the consumer goods. It does for furniture. It does for uh, dye workshops for textile mills and also leaded glass for glassworks. We're not focusing on these industries, um, so it's not necessarily super important. However, if you start out with a ton of these industries um, and you don't start out with lathe, this is going to give you a lot more capitalists. Um, mechanical tools will also do it with sulfide pulping for paper mills, but the really, 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 really important one uh, is atmospheric engine. This one gives it to you on the mines. Um, and also, it, the atmospheric engine pump is like nearly twice as efficient as the next one and it actually turns the PM good um, also going to be very important when you're focusing on wood is going to be water tube boiler um, which is 50% further more efficient um, on a you know uh, nearly 50% more efficient because it does have the coal input um, where it's going to generate way way more output and water tube boiler really is a cut above um, you know kind of the other ones as far as efficiency goes like if we just jump into the thing real quick and we look at resources we can just take a look at the iron mines the net goes from 600 to 900 to 1350 under condensing engine pump. And so it is a big difference that you are making with this one. Um, also important to note is that nitroglycerin will be pretty good as well. Um, uh, intensive agriculture, we're going to kind of want to ignore because we're not going very agrarian. And so ooh, there's one more tech. Oh, so here we go. Pump jacks is also going to be really good because it doubles the output for the agrarian goods. Often you will hit an inflection point when you hit pump jacks, and this is when the agrarian stuff can start to get good as long as it's really high in price or isn't like, uh, you know, depressed in price. Um, uh, the vulcanization is really good, but that's kind of entering the mid game. And another important one to note as it relates to ownership is mutual funds, which will allow you to give ownership. Um, it will allow commercialized agriculture and it will allow you to give uh, publicly traded, which will split the ownership between capitalists and aristocrats on the, um, you know, aristocrat owned buildings, which will make them much, much better. So an important like kind of uh, inflection point to note is when you get both mutual funds and also when you get pump jacks, then going plantations uh, in the agriculture, then it can be good, but this is starting to enter a mid game consideration, but I did just want to point it all out. So I'll try and make the summary short since the video is so long. Um, the first thing you want to recognize is that industrialization is really about two different things um, happening simultaneously. Uh, thing one is you are trying to get rid of all your peasant pops and turn them into properly employed, not fake pops. And then also you are going to be trying to switch ownership as much as possible uh, from being either aristocrat owned or shopkeeper owned to being uh, capitalist owned. Um, these are the two very critical things. Um, now, the first thing you we're going to want to do when you enter game is you are going to want to find a state as it relates to local prices you're going to want to find a state um, that has the most uh, uh, minerals you have emphasizing uh, iron and coal and logging all together you will want the three of these together and then lead mines and sulfur mines are going to be a bonus this is how you get set on your uh, you know vertical integration and then you are going to want to build things in such a way that your local prices uh, stay close to your market price because you are creating a similar number of buy orders and sell orders in the market which is 
why you want all the resources in one state uh, because when we you know build coal we're gonna have a bunch of buy orders or sorry when we build iron we're gonna have a bunch of buy orders for coal for, from our PMs and so this will allow us to buy coal cheaper at the iron mine but also sell coal more expensive here um, and so it's gonna be very critical to do this the two other things we need to consider um, is going to be if you do not have access to railroads uh, infrastructure will be an important consideration also building on the coast will be more preferable specifically in the very very early game before you get railroad these are important to consider and of course since the process is getting rid of peasants you are going to want to have access to peasants and so places like Hokkaido which only have 20k pops despite having some of the best mappy aka rainbow local prices local goods uh, they have the, every color of the rainbow despite having this it's a terrible place to build because there's only 20k pops good luck getting that up and running and so that's going to be kind of what you think about and then we are going to enter this phase where we are focused on industrialization specifically what we are going to build is we are going to build like construction goods we're going to build the goods that are in the construction loop and we are going to focus on the goods that have the least possible construction this is going to be wood prioritized only as 200 construction then iron only 400 and then uh tools which is 600 we are going to put the fabric aside for a moment and come back to that uh, but the main reason why we are focusing on the wood is it's going to de peasant pops as quickly as possible also without getting into the spreadsheet it's super super efficient on a per construction basis and so even though uh on a per building basis this logging camp isn't going to be as efficient as you know something like a textile mill uh, we the textile mill costs three times as much construction we can build three logging camps we would prefer three logging camps as long as we have a bunch of peasants when the game starts getting later and this is post industrialization you will start caring about how efficient you are on a per pop basis when you're running out and then stuff like uh textile mills and this sort of stuff stuff that costs more construction will start to become more favorable but in the very very early game wood is king now coming back to talking about well why don't we build the fabric um the fabric is not going to be preferable because well one when you shopped uh, well actually let's forget about that point when you yeah let's forget about that point but they are going to be owned by cap or not capitalists by aristocrats and aristocratic ownership is not preferable because you do not extract aristocrat uh, money from arist aristocrats in a preferable way there's really three reasons that you kind of want to hone in on the first is political you're empowering the landowners or in this case the junkers uh this is not what you want they kind of uh have all the laws that you hate that they support and they oppose everything so they're probably going to be mad at you anyways you're probably going to be getting like uh, these tax malices they're going to be big if you are trying to pass you know reasonable looking laws while having these but the two more important reasons why you don't want aristocrat ownership is related to first of all it's effectively a tax um the way you that investment pool works is they will contribute a portion of their dividends um the upper rung strata aka the owners of buildings um are the most important money uh the most important uh pops to, to extract money from you really don't want to extract money from the lower rung pops relative to the upper rung pops and so you want to extract money from these guys and aristocrats contribute 10 percent of their income to the or their dividends to the investment pool capitalists contribute 20 percent. so it's a way better tax in terms of how your uh you know taxation works the reason why is uh upper rung strata have exponential needs lower rung strata do not have exponential needs they have more linear needs and so you give 50 ducats to them they increase your average sol by more you also care about their sol more because it matters more for qualifications they don't have 100 percent literacy they almost always have 100 percent literacy and so you are going to uh you know care a lot more about this and it's going to be a really good way to extract uh from the economy you don't want to create a bunch of buy orders for consumer goods you want to create a bunch of buy orders for construction goods when you extract money from them and in order to contribute to the investment pool you will get an uh, investment pool which can be used to spend on construction goods you will increase the price in construction goods allowing you to have a higher proportion of your economy in construction goods which allows you to push economies of scale that's more of a mid-game thing um, but it is something that's worth noting and you will just get to push up construction more and you can think of your construction as your gdp growth rate so extracting money to push uh, money into construction rather than uh, letting the money just continue to uh, flow through the economy me uh, in terms of um what is this uh the the um, the consumer goods, as in the case of the aristocrats, where 90% comes into consumer goods versus capitalists, where it's 20%, this is preferable. But on top of this, on top of this, um, we have the consideration that um, uh, ca uh, industrialists, you're going to get several modifiers that increase capitalist investment pool contribution efficiency. These are free money modifiers. Um, if They always contribute 20%, but if we have this plus 10% modifier, 20% will be extracted from them. 22% will reach the investment pool. That 2%, that's free. And if it's free, it's for 
me. Um, talking briefly, touching back on peasants, why getting rid of peasants is so, so important, is they buy fake goods with fake money. Um, they get, uh, you know, subsistence output, uh, which is not uh, taken from anyone, and they only contribute a 10% of their buy orders to the market. And so um, this will help to stimulate the economy, not just because you're getting them way more efficient job, but also you're creating buy orders, which will raise the price of consumer goods. At a certain point, the consumer goods are high enough price that you building them is a little bit better. But this is generally after you've pushed construction for a little hot minute. And I think that that's just about it. Um, so if you enjoyed the video, um, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, uh, do the YouTube algorithm thing. It does help out. And other than that, other than that, have a good day. Wait, 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 wait. I almost forgot. One more thing. Now, children, I was asked to bring a healthy snack. So join me in the hall for swine livers and Capri Suns. Uh -huh.